Hello everyone, this is Space Cafe Podcast and I am Marcus. We have something to celebrate today, my friends. The Space Cafe podcast is turning 50. Yes, you heard right. And I hereby ignite a candle. Solid fuel, of course. I'm recording these lines in a hotel room in Austin, Texas. It's 6.45 in the morning. And since my day is very busy and jet lag is still, well, present, I thought I'd get up a little earlier for you. I'm at South by Southwest, one of the biggest culture, entertainment and technology festivals in the world, where it is usually about the music industry, the film industry, entertainment. This year, everything is very meta. Of course, I'm talking about the metaverse, but also space-oriented. Space has obviously come a long way to where it also belongs, to the entertainment industry. A clear indication that the subject has taken root culturally, and socially. So what topics are covered here, you ask? Okay, ready for it? Space health, black women in space, seeing Earth from space, future of space, space missions design, space colonization, green space, space economy for Texas, commercial space stations, space revolution, democratizing space, space tech, disrupting space, blah, 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 blah. I could go on. So where does Europe stand in all of this? Where is the European space industry headed? It's best to talk to someone who has deep insight. Okay, my name is Hans-Jörg Dieters. I'm a professor of space systems at the University of Bremen in Germany. Until recently, the professor was on the board of the German Aerospace Center, but not anymore. What makes speaking about certain topics a lot easier. Welcome, Hans-Jörg Dieters. There is no way not to talk about what's currently going on in the world between Russia and Ukraine. But what does all this mean to the space industry? It's maybe too early to see complete, a complete picture at the moment. I mean, first of all, there is what we can see clear, a clear answer with respect to defense strategies. Mm -hmm. This has to be based in the future much more on satellite technology, in my opinion. So this is where well, we have a lag in Europe maybe so far. And so that's what I think will come up. We will have more satellites in orbit for communication, navigation, and uh, of course for surveillance. And this might be, uh, first of all, the first consequence out of that. On the other side, it's a strong disturbance to what has been done in the last, I would say, 20, 25 years. The world is not longer working together. And mm -hmm. th this is strong consequences at the same time uh, to what has to be done at least here in Europe. And just to give you an example, we all relied on Russian rocket, rockets for a long time now, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they cannot be replaced just one by one at the moment and, right. um, mm -hmm. and many other things. This will have strong consequences on the other side. So there is maybe more business we can expect on one side. On the other side, there's a lot of disturbance and mm -hmm. brings us back to what had been at the time of Cold War. Yeah? What does all this mean to signature projects like ExoMars, ExoLunar? Uh, I, there is no decision so far, from my, as, as I had been informed so far in the last days, but they will come up definitely. At the, at the, that's what I'm expecting is they will be stopped because they have to, we cannot stop all things and run space technology and cooperation space project as business as usual. That's not possible. We will see what will happen, but there have been, there are stronger consequences out of that than uh, some space projects. When, when it's been stopped all the, the gas pipelines and so on, this is much more expensive. And it's, I think, I'm afraid that we stop the cooperation projects with the Russians sooner or later, completely. Mm -hmm. Have you had any contact with Russian scientists, with Russian... No. No, definitely okay. not. My last contacts are from exchanging of some newer addresses around Christmas time and so, but in the meantime, there was no contact and I don't expect hmm. any contact at the moment. Maybe okay. we'll come up soon, but this is definitely, it's, 
at the moment is very difficult because all is suspicious in some way. <laughs> sure. People sure. are afraid so any... to do it. And, and I think it's on both sure. sides. There's a lot of reluctancy on both sides and it's not easy for the people. No. What can all this mean now also for Germany, for the DLR, for space in Europe? What do you think? Is it still too early? I'm no longer responsible for DLR. I had been responsible for DLR. Mm -hmm. I would have, have, in that time, I would have said we have to see because, I mean, all this situation, which I mean, is an awful situation, definitely. I mean, there had been an initiated uh, war by a country in Europe, and this is... We all have to understand what really happened in the last days. Mm -hmm. And I think um, this is um, a personal problem of each of us. On the other side, whenever this happens, there are chances as well. Maybe we had been trusted too much into, into safety forever. Maybe we have trusted too much in this international cooperation without having contracts, real contracts or mm -hmm. clear basis of sustainability. So this is the chance that we stay together in Europe more than in the past, develop defense strategy and doctrine and find out what we can do with all our European partners together to avoid stronger consequences in the future in space technology. I mean, space technology is one of the key fields in all military strategies. Not in Europe, it's only small, in my mm -hmm. opinion. Europe relied on the partners, maybe mainly mm -hmm. on on our partners in the US, of course, we now have to realize that we have to do more in technology development to develop our own and free society in the future. Mm -hmm. It's an awful situation. Mm -hmm. The more awful things are, the more they deliver chances as well on the other side, yeah. because one has to think about there's no way out. We have to think about yes. it. And this might, I mean, that's what we have seen in the last day only, which is just five days. And, and now yes. we have a completely different discussion in, in, in Germany and in, in all over Europe. And I think this will happen in the future. And maybe it's, it's a warning for all of us that we cannot rely on a situation forever and that we have to be careful. The, so if we if we try to now reframe everything in a very positive way, because this is a depressing situation in the first place, but now where do you see particularly for Germany, a chance for the future? Where could Germany play a major role in the future or put itself more into the spotlight, especially when it comes to space travel, space technologies? Yeah, first of all, we have a strong technology basis all over Europe, not only in Germany, but in Germany, of course, because of the size of the country, of the economical power, There's a lot we can do, and maybe what we are what, be, beside France and Italy, we are the, the, the leading countries in Europe with respect to space technology, I would say. On the other side, and, and this has now been used to do the right things, and we have to concentrate more on, on what we call defense strategies in the future. The European space sector had been based on civil applications more, mm -hmm. much more than on military. And... The question is why a free society needs a defense strategy as well. And it was not ESA's task to take care of that. On the other side, it was also not really EU's task to take care of that. And when we do it in the individual countries only, it's maybe not well coordinated. Mm -hmm. I have read just recently an article, Europe spends much more money in total than Russia into military technology, in technology development in total as well. So we spend a lot of money, but it's poorly coordinated in many cases. Mm -hmm. And this has mm -hmm. to be improved. And we need a stronger authority of mm -hmm. Euro European authorities. It's, mm -hmm. I don't mean, I mean, ESA is a lobby club, so to say, in mm -hmm. industrial lobby. <laughs> this is maybe not the right instrument To, to give to respond on that. But this has to be coordinated between the governments and we need, for example, authorities in Europe, they can do that in the future. Similar to what they do in the US has a space command in space. Also the Russians have a cosmic command and mm -hmm. we, we don't have in Europe so far. Mm -hmm. Although we all rely on space technology in our defense strategies. Mm. 
But what would be different if we had such a European Space Command? What would be different? The coordination. Hmm. The coordination and the development behind the, the closed doors in many cases. What we are doing uh, is not an open market. That's what I missed in Europe in the last 10, 20 years. We relied on a free and open world for all time. And so you can do it as a long time and this works perfectly. And But at a certain point, if you develop technology, you have to be more careful with publications, mm -hmm. with announcements. We were doing, this has to be based on a clear strategy decided by the governments in Europe. And the, I mean, it's not easy to do though. I, I guess it's not easy. It's one, maybe uh, one of the most difficult problems we face in Europe. On the other side, now everyone sees the necessity to do so. It's interesting to see how we in the media world see ESA, for example. And I think this nicely plays into the soft criticism that you were just trying to formulate. Namely, that ESA portrays itself with a very broad tip. So there is no clear focus towards something. So you get like everything. And if you want to talk to somebody at ESA, it's hard to find out who to talk with. And so maybe it could be beneficial and useful, as you were mentioning, to focus one's strength and bring things together. This is the experience I'm making. Yeah, but one has to see back in history and it's, it's not ESA's task. Mm -hmm. ESA's task was had been founded in the 70s, yeah, in the, in the early 70s, late 60s, uh, step by step, first for the launcher development as an answer uh, to what happened in the US to bring up telecommunication satellites, which had been an urgent task at that time. And then they succeeded in ESA with the Ion development, Ion 4, you might remember, first launched in the late 70s, very successfully. And, but th it, it was always the task of ESA to develop technology for civil and peaceful activities. This is, there was never ever said anything else. And th this is the history and is also our own history here in Germany. We made very clear that we will not develop any technology for applications in, in military, te in military regimes. Fields. And the, and, mm -hmm. and the, the it, this is the understanding of ESA up to now. And ESA on the other side is not an, an also a, Euro, a really European authority. Mm -hmm. It's guided by a ministerial conference. Each mm -hmm. country, each member state in ESA can decide individually. And it's not an authority, a European authority like a government, which can say mm -hmm. this is our agency. It's mm -hmm. all members' agency, so it is quite mm -hmm. complicated. And we have members, as you may know, in ESA, they are not European countries mm -hmm. in the uh, close sense of EU members, for example, Norway mm -hmm. or Switzerland, Canada, and they have discussions on bringing in more from overseas, maybe. So this is um, an industrial development organization for joint undertakings in deep space, in uh, Earth observation, and all the tasks they servicing are peaceful, and yes. there is no relation to. It. So when it's it's hard to criticize ESA in this case because it's not their task. Mm -hmm. On the other side, I think what we missed in Europe is to build up authorities which take care exactly of that with respect to space because it became more and more important. And I think, if not now, it was clear long before that we need, of course, surveillance. We need, of course, observation. We need, of course, information. We need uh, communication uh, lines, secure communication, navigation. All that is very important. And you started to do this, I would say, roughly 20, 25 years ago, but with, lo with low money, with low budgets. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now it's, going, it's, it's coming more and more. And I think we now see that there is more necessity to do it. And observation, of course, is one of the main tasks where we can rely on security. Yeah? Mm -hmm. speaking, speaking of observation, that brings me to something um, I remember from our first meeting half a year ago in the Tyrol, in Austria, in Altbach, where we met, where you said to me, there are so many things 
you could talk about, but you cannot talk about because you were still with DLR. So you said, so you made me curious, of course. Now you're not with DLR anymore. Maybe it's more likely that we can have a little chat about what you were referring to back then. Yeah, let's start with the most important thing we need if we like to go into space. These are the rockets. Without a mm -hmm. rocket, we can dream or whatever we like. We can never fly to any destination far out the earth. So the most important thing is the rocket. Mm -hmm. We in Europe have a rocket development based on the very successful Ariane development in the 70s, which is always had been always the same. It had mm -hmm. been uh, directed to uh, come into business for satellites, which have to be uh, brought up to geostationary orbits mainly. And that's it. Mm -hmm. And all the Ariane development had been based on the assumption that this becomes a business forever mm -hmm. and a business which is increasing. This worked some time and Europe had been the most successful rockets with respect to that. This was first Ariane 4, later mm -hmm. Ariane 5. And we can, I mean, one can criticize this, this policy, but it was very successful and Ariane 4 and 5 had been successful rockets very precise, very secure, and all that. And it was maybe not a big business, but it had been a development where, we, where Europeans could be proud of. This was mm -hmm. substantial. But in the last years, the situation changed dramatically. There are more and more military purposes. And a, a liquid rocket like Ariane 4 or 5 is not a military because it, it needs much too long to bring it to to launch. Uh, we have a mm -hmm, production mm -hmm. time of three years for IN-5. Mm -hmm. So my criticism one year, two years ago was if we have rockets like that, the war is over before the rocket is ready. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so whenever we need a satellite in orbit, we have to bring it up in short time. Mm -hmm. So we need the rocket systems. They can deliver that in very short time. And this is not what we have in Europe. On the mm -hmm. other side, we had been relied on, we, we relied on um, lot, lot, big satellites in uh, telecommunication for geostationary orbit. Then we talk about six ton, eight ton mass satellite, massive satellites. I think we need them in the future as well, but not as much as we had in the past, because now we have more flexible business and no one did the necessity um, or recognized the necessity to develop a smaller rockets. Um, to do that as response actions, mm -hmm. yeah, so you, you have to do it. So it, the rocket policy was based on the assumption that's a business forever, mm -hmm. and it's not. And the business is not longer made in um, geostationary orbit transport. Mm -hmm. It's not longer made in in satellite transport at all. These rockets become cheaper and cheaper with the, so for example, RLV technology, reusable launch vehicles like Elon Musk is doing with the SpaceX. And they diminished, they brought down the prices to half the prices we had before. Yeah, M more. It's Now you can buy rockets for less than 40 million on the market with um, transport capacities up to five tons in, in geostationary orbits. So this had been never, never been before with the reusable technology. And on the other side, new market situations had been, or the new markets had been opened. And okay, there's the military one on one side. I guess this will uh, become, come up to to more in the future. Then Ariane can help as well, because I mean, you need Earth observation from, from, from polar orbits. You need the telecommunication in the future. On the other side, the big business cannot be made with that because Who pays for that is the public. Mm -hmm. sure. And if the public is paying, it will never become a business. So public orders what they need. And they, this is not driven by a market. The market, always, we ourselves, we can order or not. If we have no money, we do. If we, have, we, we do not, mm -hmm. if we have money, we do. Mm -hmm. The business is now done. And this might be a little bit surprising with human, with human transport, yeah? All mm -hmm. the factories in the U.S. are now dire directing their business to transport of human beings into space. And that's the expectation. 
And you can ask whatever you like. Is it too expensive? Can this be paid only by some billionaires? Now, yes. But in the future, it's changing. No. And we could ask the question with respect to, to many other fields as well. The humans at the very end, they make the market. And if humans are there, they like to fly. They will fly in the future. And if you ask th these companies, their business policy is bring up human beings into space. That's not what we're doing in, in Europe. There is, in my opinion, I, don't ne I never understood there is an understanding between governments never to do this uh, with human beings because it's too expensive. Mm -hmm. But that's not true. Mm -hmm. I had been Could, asked maybe one thing. If you compare it maybe to with the situation in airplane development, the first flight, it, I, I heard it was not the very first flight, but the first flight uh, over the... North Atlantic was Charles Lindbergh, 1927. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this was an adventure. Soon he had passengers. And they did the same, did the same adventure. I think they paid a lot. Mm -hmm. The first transatlantic flight lines had been open, a line had been opened by Pan Am 1938. With mm -hmm. at that time, water landing Boeing C-314. This had been huge planes, they would not be mm -hmm. able to land on, on runways. They had to mm -hmm. land on water and they flew mm -hmm. from Long Island to Marseille, mm -hmm. two, I think two times a week. And the ticket price at that time was roughly more than two times the average income in German per year. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That was one way. Mm -hmm. Today we paid both ways. 10% of our monthly income. Mm -hmm. So if we now say, okay, let's take a flight to space by 20 million, mm -hmm. maybe, I don't know, maybe it's 25, maybe it's less. I have no idea. I never asked for mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. <laughs> I think we both cannot pay. Um, <laughs> uh, if you now ask us the 20 million and you take the, tw the factor of 250 which is the price drop from 1938 to 1920. It's 80 years, yeah? And we say, okay, what will happen in 2000? It's 20 years from now, yeah? Then, and we, we, we say, okay, 20 million divided by 250, you end up maybe with mm -hmm. 80,000 euro. Mm -hmm. And you say, okay, this is expensive from a today's ba uh, cost basis. Yes, it's expensive. But have you any idea what a, a ticket costs to bring you up to uh, Mount Everest? Mm -hmm. It's if you go with the help and fine, yeah, it costs mm -hmm. you up to fifty thousand to come up to the summit of Mount Everest, and wow. a lot of people pay. Mm -hmm. So and and so it will become a business, mm -hmm. and we will see that what has you cannot hint a business, and you can ask whatever you like. People make the market. So it's my opinion. What do you think? And maybe this is a question with a tricky answer, but do you think that Ariane 6 is facing the same fate SLS may be facing? Too expensive, too heavy, too big to have a future? Mate, okay, it's not this big as SLS. <laughs> On the other side, it's it was against the market. And no one can tell me, and that's, my, that's what I could... I mean, you can criticize whatever you like, but no one in, in, in 2016, 2015, 2016, when it has been discussed, could really justify that there will be a market. Whatever mm. we did in studies at that time showed us that the market will never come. Because at that time, already we had the expectation that other technologies will be more competitive. Mm -hmm. And... RLV technologies, as it has been now used, definitely more competitive. And you can ask why, but th there is a lot of development in, and also the market segments uh, to go to geostationary orbits were going down at that time already. So what we have now is that there is a small market only. For, and the market segment, which was really big for Iron 5, I think roughly 50% of all launches into geostationary orbit had been transported by Iron 5, but the European mm -hmm. rocket is gone. Now we can expect two, three, maybe four launches a year. So I, it's a, 
That is not allowed. So it's developed, to be honest, against the market. And another problem, it needed much too long. It had been, the idea was to bring it up not later than 2019. We have now 2022 and we will need us another year at least to bring it up to orbit. So this is, it's lost of time. This is time we lost to bring it up. And so I think we're wasting money here. We're wasting money. Yeah, no, not maybe. Yeah, wasting money on one side. On the other side, it's there is no no strong development. The question is, who can earn money with a rocket? No one. It has been mm -hmm. paid by the public because the companies mm -hmm. they build it, they will not do any business with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there is no market. That's what they clearly realized. Yeah, so, so their the interest bold... is small to bring it up. Yeah? So the bold move then could be to kill the project whatsoever and reroute the funds to maybe private ventures as the, the Americans are doing it with, with, with SpaceX. So if you take, for example, ESA Aerospace, I don't know, I'm just coming up with it from the top of my head. Would that make sense? Yes and no. I think the, the U.S. history tells us the problem. In the U.S., they made a systematic buildup of companies like SpaceX and um, Blue Origin and so on. Mm -hmm. yeah? What they did was clear. They stopped the big developments at Boeing and Lockheed and all these big companies. And they started a new program from a stretch, from early beginning. And all the companies, also the big ones, had to compete in this program from the early beginning. They started with very small contracts to develop a new rocket strategy. Mm -hmm. And at the end, not the big one won, because there was much too expensive for them. All the companies had to pass the program over years. And it had to be, had to run in competition all time. And at the end, some of them survived for many, mm -hmm. for not all for the same segment. They did, they made a clear distinguish, distinguishment between the human transport to space station for many other business. And, and at the end, they developed the market. This, mm -hmm. of course, you could say you make the same in Europe, but you will fail. Mm -hmm. Why? First of all, our market is so small. That's not worth to take care of it. Yeah. We have a, if we compare the, the expenses in space technology in Europe, in all countries, in ESA, in EU, and if you, if you take all the money and sum it up, you come up with maybe six billion a year. <laughs> yeah. If you go to US, NASA budget only is 22 billion. Mm -hmm. And there's a huge and unknown only estimated um, budget for military expenses in, in space technology, which might be another 50 to 60 billion or more. Whatever we have in the U.S. is 10, maybe 15 times higher than we have in Europe. So now to say we do the same exactly they do in the U.S. will fail as well. And the question is, if we now say, okay, let's go to, to small rockets only or the question is, where's the market? A, a small rocket like ESA Aerospace or the others um, are developing can only run in competition with, uh, with international competitors uh, as they are now in the market if you have a lot of launches every year. And then we talk about 20, 30, better 40 launches a year, maybe 50. Each week, one launch. Presently, we have one a year, maybe mm -hmm. two a year. So we are far behind that. So it needs public money, but it needs a clear strategy. And it needs, that's what I always criticized. It needs also public involvement. You cannot rely on a private, on a private industry where there's no driver to do it. I mean, what should drive an industry to deliver a rocket which no one likes to use? Mm -hmm. And this is... <laughs> And, and, and so I think it, it cannot be directly compared to what happens in the U.S. On the other side, we can learn how we have to how we have to decide and how we have to go on. And maybe it might be sensible to come together with other countries with similar problems, for example, Japan, and to do it together with Japan and Europe. 
and they have the same geopolitical problems than we. Mm -hmm. Maybe, but this is, of course, a, a question, a very open question. Do you see new space, the new space industry, as a global endeavor, or do you see it as a national or individual endeavor? Because if it's a global endeavor, then Europe may try to find out what its role could be. Maybe it's not the launchers, maybe it's something else. So, but first of all, how do you see the new space industry built up? Is it global or is it national or local? It's global. But presently, it's not done in that way in Europe. In Europe, it's done in the same way than before. The public make the decision, it's not the market. I mean, you mentioned ESA Aerospace. We have, as you may know, two other companies in in Germany as well, with small rockets. But behind these rockets are the big ones. Yeah? Behind ESA space is Airbus. Yeah? Behind mm -hmm. the rocket factories, there is, there is OHB and others. So th the business runs the same. Yeah? There is no risk. Yeah? No real risk. The risk is, we have seen how Elon Musk did it. Yeah? There was a lot of risk in he he paid in more than 150 million at the beginning. No one mm -hmm. does it in mm -hmm. Europe so far. There's mm -hmm. another problem. We don't have entrepreneurship in Europe. This is, a, but this is a, a cultural problem more than a space problem. Where's the entrepreneurship in Europe? There's the ESA business incubator. Yeah, yeah. I hope that it, the proof is if companies are coming out of that system. But I think we need it not only in ESA. The ESA money is small. We need it in all of Europe, in all technology fields, and we haven't. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. I mean, we have other, we would say, disruptive technology fields where I missed the same. This is entrepreneurship. We have to train young people to do it, to go to risk, and we have to help them. And the question is, whatever we do uh, is following strong rules. But... It's the, the question is always, where is the disruptive technology? But my mm -hmm. question is, where is the disruptive funding for that dis um, technology? I can give you another example. I just worked for that. As we, we talked about in Alpbach, you might remember, uh, this mm -hmm. was quantum computing. Quantum computing is one of the biggest fields in supporting, uh, supported by our governments in Europe. Germany pays in 2 billion, Russia, uh, Fr France 1.8 billion. There's a lot of money in UK. There's a lot of money in Italy and so on and in US. But in and, and EU, on the other side, when we ask the question, who does this job? The answer is, of course, startup companies. But the startup companies had been asked to pay in 50% of the supporting mm -hmm. funds. If you have 2 billion, who would? How big has to be the startup uh, mm -hmm. scenery to get the other two billions for it? So mm -hmm. it can never work with 50% funding, which is an EU rule. So we have to change the rules, first of all, and mm -hmm. EU is doing it. But it's too slow. Mm -hmm. We need too much time to change the rules. And there is too much discussion on risking the money. We, these are lost fundings, maybe. But we have to go to risk and have to pay it to the people. And then there might be a chance that we can compete with the world market. And we need a society which is not controlling, but trusting their entrepreneurs. And that's mm -hmm. what I'm missing. Definitely. This is all control. We have always discussions on, do they spend the money in the right way? And it's not to say, okay... We celebrate the success and we, now we come back to what, what, what is on space. Yeah. In many cases, it's also the technology which is um, exciting, which uh, excites also the people. And if you see uh, when Elon Musk is launching a rocket and roughly 20 minutes later, the boosters are landing on the same site in parallel, maybe what he has demonstrated. Yeah. Then there's. Along the streets, there are millions of people yeah. to watch it. Mm -hmm. If you watch an, an Ariane 6 launch or 5 launch now, yeah, no one is there. Some hundred. Okay, it's in Kourou, but it, it, no one would be there because you launch the rocket and it disappears in the clouds and nothing happens anymore. So it's also the technology which is exciting people, 
and decision make at the same time. So sec- my, my criticism is in a society which is also thinking about security and safety for the age. It's an, age, it's an aging society, yeah? And, and they'll um, have slogans for EU to make Europe the, yeah, the knowledge society number one in the world. Mm. This is a boring slogan, to be honest. People like to see the technology, the biggest mm-hmm. planes, the, f- the most exciting rockets and so on. And that's mm-hmm. what I'm missing in space. Technology could uh, help We're lacking. to rise some um, emotions. Yeah. And whatever you sell needs emotions. We're lacking a visionary person, in my opinion, because you can say whatever you want to say about Elon Musk, but he has a vision, a very clear vision, and he knows how to play the communication game because, of course, we know it's a game. And can rise emotions. And we Europeans, we're failing time and again when it comes to communication. What I observe is a more fundamental reluctancy with respect celebrating big successes, the society's development. So we, we could yes. be proud of our uh, technology developments. And we, we did so many things in Europe. We, we say, okay, this is developed by ourselves. And this, but this is uh, not, not well accepted by our society. I, I think that the Rosetta mission was a very good example as to how it should be done. Not only Rosetta, we had many other missions as well. It was um, really exciting and people had been fascinated about what happened there. And I often observed this, but it will definitely work in the future as well. But I cannot understand this behavior because whatever, it, every salesman knows it, 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 it knows it. If you sell a car, yeah, you sell it not because it's the most economic or the the most the cheapest car. You sell it because the color is exciting, the mm-hmm. seats are nice, the the, the the shape, the design, and at at the end, it's the, the question: How does it look like with mm-hmm. respect to my old car? So there's mm-hmm. emotion, in, and whatever we we buy is based on our emotions, and that's what I'm missing. I can. Maybe have we have a little bit of time for two minute story. I was asked for a discussion in ESA in 2003. That was the time when we already had the idea to fly to Mars, only Mars, and then suddenly change to Moon again. This was 2004. <laughs> but we came mm-hmm. together in 2003 for nearly a year and a huge board invited by ESA uh, to discuss the goals for human space flight within the next 25 years. Mm-hmm. And of course, and there was a lot of people and the minority had been people, they really had any relation to space technology. Mm-hmm. There had been theologists, there had been social sciences people, people from many economy, mm-hmm. of course. And at the beginning, everyone had been asked, what do you think where we should be in the next 25 years? And we as space, as space um, enthusiasts, we said, okay, the moon might be a nice goal because the Mars wind will never attain in this time frame. <laughs> so they killed us nearly. They said, okay, mm-hmm. come, come on. This is much too small, this goal. We as you Europeans, <laughs> we will fly to far distant destinations, mm-hmm. galaxies, wherever. And, and so it, without any rela- sense for reality, but no, on the other side. And then we started a long discussion. And at the end... We had only the moon and the moon was sold as, um, exploring the eighth continent. Mm -hmm. I found this a nice title because it's indeed the eighth continent of earth. Mm -hmm. And it maybe then we have this conqueror idea, this idea of exploring a new world Mm -hmm. and things like that. But then the question came up, what to do on moon? There is no water. There is only sand. There's nothing rocks. It's a boring environment, of course. And to say, okay, it's the archive of the old earth. It's not enough mm-hmm. to, 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 to pay for that. And there was a mm-hmm. young guy in this group. And one day he stood up and he said, what you're discussing is definitely very boring and it will not succeed. You will not succeed <laughs> because if you like to fly to moon, if I would do it, I would spend the first 100 million only for PR actions. So ESA mm-hmm. should do that. 
we make a casting for the astronauts. That would be the first action we make. We start a one, one and a half year program to cast the astronauts flying to moon. And with all the, the money we can earn from the advertisement, we can pay the rest of the mission. Right. This exactly. was his provocating, this provoking uh, statement. And then, he, then the people ask him, then what to do in moon? I said, that's quite easy. You have to do something everyone can understand within Literally. 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. So I give you an example. Why do people need a soccer game or a soccer world championship or mm -hmm. Olympic games? No one needs it. No one. It's only to earn money. And you can earn money only by arising emotions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If and a, 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 a soccer game is quite easy to understand, yeah. Who has more goals at the end is the winner. Right. So this right. is understood within ten seconds, yeah. And uh, he, and then the people ask him what to do, and he said, "Yeah, we are in Europe, and our goal should be bring the American flag back to Earth." <laughs> and people were laughing and saying, "Okay, come on!" But he yeah. said, "No, that's a goal." And um, okay, it was not serious enough, but on the other side, it was a nice joke. This kind of goals are yeah. fascinating us. <laughs> and you would say, this Absolutely. is a competition. Maybe only men, I have no idea. No, that's wonderful. <clears throat> that's just wonderful. It's Sometimes it's the small goals, the very human needs that are tapped into that make bigger venture is possible. Let's go back to Elon Musk. I think at one point he said he wants to colonize Mars. Like, not only going to Mars. I mean, like, that could be something already. No, I want to colonize Mars. Now that's something. And we're talking millions of people. Okay, now I'm listening because this is crazy enough to get my attention. Yeah, on the yeah. other side, when he, I, I followed him on one of his presentations, some years ago, and he came in like a superstar mm -hmm. with a big show. Mm -hmm. And there were roughly 1,000 people at a big hall. Mm -hmm. It was in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And they all applauding him. Open mm -hmm. applause during his presentation, like in a concert. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And he exactly told the story of bringing up 10,000 of people mm -hmm. to Mars within the next mm -hmm. time. It was not clearly mm -hmm. said how much, mm -hmm. maybe 300 years, 400 years, 500, mm -hmm. 1,000 years. It's a, it doesn't take, uh, it, it's, it's no matter. At the end, we did calculations for his plans. They indeed work. They can work. <laughs> it's, it's many, <laughs> it, from a technical point of view, it's not unrealistic to do. It's only a question of time. Yeah. It's a question of the willingness. Yes. But it's not a problem of technology. Maybe a mm -hmm. problem of medical care during the flights, because that's a risk. You fly too long, maybe, and mm -hmm. this has to be solved, this problem. But I guess we will do it. Like what we're lacking in Europe is boldness. This kind of boldness to stand up and tell the world a crazy plan. When have you heard that from a European? Because we're all about playing it safe. Let's but go it's to the history. moon. I mean, if you see how they <laughs> immigrated in their country from Europe, for yeah, yeah. there were thousands, millions of people on sailing boats. Mm -hmm. A sailing boat at that time needed roughly six weeks from Europe to the mm -hmm. US. Mm -hmm. And it was a high risk to go. Mm -hmm. Many of them had been killed, not because of uh, storms and so on, killed by diseases on board. Yeah. So you, there was terrible conditions on board of these sailing boats and the people came to the country and detected a new country where they could do whatever they liked in principle. And this is their history. And we in Europe, we stayed here and we're laughing about it. And that if, if not necessary, we will stay here. And I think this mentality is still there up to now. Yes. <laughs> so maybe they are more risky indeed as, a, as another society. Yeah? Mm. Professor Ditus, what inspires you personally, when it comes to global space adventures, space endeavors, new space, what inspires you? I come from geophysics originally, mm -hmm. and I was studying physics and uh, with, with uh, focus on our own Earth. And that was fascinating for me at that time. And then we started to compare the Earth with other planets. And to be honest, I was mostly impressed in 1970, you think about it, it was three or four, 
when the first pictures came back to Earth from Jupiter by Voyager mm -hmm. 10. No, not the Voyager, Pioneer 10. Pioneer 10. Mm -hmm. Pioneer 10 and 11, it had been the first spacecraft passing the um, asteroid belt, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which at that time had been expected as a high-risk mission. And I was 1973, I was 16 years old, and I was fascinated about these pictures from another planet, from a huge giant a uh, planet never seen before. And, and step by step, we got these fantastic pictures from all the planets. And as a geophysicist at that time, later on, I started studying 1977. From this point, I was fascinated about this exploration of our solar system. And this was a new world. And more fascinating, all the bodies looked differently. Mm-hmm. If you go to our moon, it might be a little bit boring to say, okay, we understood mm -hmm. the moon. No, we haven't seen it completely. But if all the bodies around us, the planets and the moons, whatever we visit, look the same like the moon, we would have given up. But now we fly to Mars. It's completely different than the Venus, completely different than Mercury. And you might remember the, the, the very fascinating pictures from Pluto with Absolutely. Horizon 2000. That was Unbelievable, the landscape there. And now we are exploring exoplanets. We fly out and see that there are worlds we never have been expect, never have been expected. Uh, I was it, completely fascinated yeah. about Huygens landing on mm -hmm. the Saturn moon, moon Titan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And you see, this is still one of the subjects I, I discuss in my lectures with the students. I say, look, there we have a, a, a landscape. It looks a little bit like on Earth. We have lakes, mm -hmm. but the lakes are not made from water. They are made from methane. And it's raining methane out of clouds. Mm -hmm. And there's a completely different world, but it's so fascinating and so different on short distance of one solar system yeah, that it's worth you to know, think about. You know what? I, I sometimes get very emotional when thinking about that lander being at that location right now, as we speak, lonely, standing there. A piece of human-made hardware is right now at that place, millions and millions of kilometers away. The Philae probe, for example, is sitting on that piece of rock right now. I mean, like, this is deeply touching to think of that. We had the same with the uh, mascot lander on the this small shoebox. And when I, when it was a, a two years project only when we did it to build it up, but it was fascinating when we landed. We needed 20 minutes to get a confirmation that we have been, that we have landed. It was five and half past four in the morning when we got the signal. Mm -hmm. And I remember the, the, the situation when, when we got this confirmation. And it is, it's unbelievable that this piece of hardware is there and it's there probably forever. Right. At least, not, maybe not forever, but a long time. And um, that, you're right. This yeah. is emotion, and this is fascinating. And as you have new worlds and um, unknown worlds, and that's what I tell my students all the time. What we are doing, we explore the terra incognita. We have no idea how it looks like. We have only ideas it could look like that and have to be prepared on all the problems they could occur. And this is fascinating. And the, and the fun thing that brings me back and closes now the circle beautifully with Carl Sagan's pale blue dot analogy, when he, I mean, like he so beautifully reminds us, or he tried to remind us that we know nothing about anything. I mean, like this is just this speck of dust in that light beam. And we consider ourselves and all those things that are happening right now so super important. Of course, they're important because this is the world we live in, but this is nothing in comparison to what is going on out there. And that's super inspiring also sometimes to me. Well, but it's, there is more because it, it, it goes beyond. It's not only our own life, our own planet, which we have not really understood. We haven't understood the complete mindset. There is a, a big cosmos and what is driving all that? This is what is yeah. fascinating me. And there we need space technology to explore at least a little bit. When I was a student in, this, in the late 70s and visited lectures in astronomy, 
and also astronomy and cosmology was at that time one subject. And it was cosmology. And we in cosmology, we had one equation with three parameters. And the people told me, I said, okay, why do you look into these lectures? It's like religion. You can believe it or not. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. it's, it's, it, you have a theory and the theory is depending on parameters you don't know. So you can take whatever you like, set it in and you get a new world. Mm -hmm. It needed us 25, no, 15 years later in 1990, 1991, when Kobe was measuring the, the microwave background radiation the mm -hmm. first time, it became very clear that we have an answer how our cosmos is structurized. And today, cosmology is a precision science. We can measure what we have argued. And this is fascinating for me. It was really short time on the long scale of, um, of development. We needed roughly 100 years to understand that our cosmos was not static, as Einstein mm -hmm. at the beginning believed, mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. but a highly dynamic system. And, and we understand the rules. We don't understand the reasons, but the rules. <laughs> and this you know is fascinating. We can explain it with our physics laws. That this is a, a, at least a success story. Yeah. You know what the fun thing is, because you're mentioning Einstein, that the cosmological constant he used back in the day is revisited these days by some in order to help us understand what we don't understand. Yeah, yeah it's, it's true. But he was, he was caught by his, by his religious tradition, as we all are. He couldn't think about a, yes. a, a dynamic cosmos. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, It was unbelievable for him that this will uh, be a dynamic construction. And mm -hmm. he had to learn. And as we all have to learn every day. And sometimes, and this might those the circle. Many of this understanding of our cosmos had been developed and had been developed in the thirties, in the forties and the fifties of last century. And there was this big Los Alamos program in the, in the US, and the reason had been clear to develop an awful bomb. On the other side, it was the first time, and maybe the only time, when the leading physicists of a huge country like the U.S. came together in one project mm -hmm. of national security and learned from each other. The gravitational physicists learned about stellar physics due to the fact that they understood fusion and so on. And at the end, they understood how, for example, a star works mm -hmm. as a dynamic object. Mm -hmm. So this was a breakthrough with respect to many key technologies or key science recognitions, we understood the world much better than before. And the unfortunate thing about it is that back in the day, those researchers, they had their Russia-Ukraine moment as we're having it right now. Also, of course, on a different level with the Germans and the, the Second World War. So it seems like we can only be creative at the brink of destruction. <laughs> no, I wouldn't say that because we are creative any time. But if there is the need to develop something, we are more concentrating on it. And the money was there. Mm. They could ask for money as whatever they liked. They got it because, and this is, a they had a common goal. this is, yeah, fear yes. was, fear was driving it. Yeah. Fear sells, unfortunately, only fear. And this is what I think when we are in secure situation, then no one takes care of science and development and new technology, because then we talk, we dream about the big business and nice holidays and so on. But if the problem stays at the front door, then we are faced directly with the problems and they could be serious, really serious. And at that time they had been serious, more serious maybe than today. They were concentrating on that and, had, and took all the money to develop this bomb. Oh, what? The outcome of course, right. we know all, but nevertheless, we had been concentrating on it. Professor Ditos, one last question, if I may, and I'm taking total advantage of you being here. What's out there? What's behind the horizon? To my own. <laughs> horizon. You're, let's, I think this is the only real thing we can talk about. But no, seriously, what's behind the horizon of the visible universe? So what is oh. outside the universe to you as 
an expert in that world. Uh, I, I assume that you have that you are as hopeless as I am and as our listeners are, but maybe you with your background are trying to deal differently with that insane question. No, I, I, I'm not hopeless. Because, okay, there was a time when we all thought that this must be de determined by physical laws. And the last consequence is that we disappear in a dark sky without any future in some billion years. I don't think so. Because I think it became more and more clear for me that the free will is there. Uh, so we can influence our future. Maybe not in a way that we can change the world completely and that we can change a lot in the world, but that there is something like what we call intellectual and so that is creative enough. And maybe we are small creatures in a world and um, our intellectualism is not as high as others it's existing somewhere. I have no idea. So I believe in this intellectualism somewhere. And this is the old joke. Is there intellectual life in, in our cosmos? <laughs> And what we have seen in the last week, we can say we have not detected so far. And, <laughs> but I think that there is, there is something where we can hope for. And there is something uh, which tells us that this is not, uh, not all determined by frustrating physics behind. Uh, because we haven't understood. This would be surprising if we could say with what we know from now, we can definitely say what will happen with all that in the future. I think there is some, um, there is more. I don't know what, but there must be more. I have this optimism, but I cannot tell what. This is not possible. This, Does it? It is only because I can't believe, and from thinking I can't believe, that is all determined by boring laws of, of nature. That, 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 or the, and I, I, I should say there are other laws of nature which are dominating our, we know, ours we know, there must be something behind. Because if we have now expansion rates, dark matter, dark energy, we haven't understood why. This is for sure. This is why we're calling it dark, because we have no So I have some hope man, for my, my, my <laughs> own life is short enough to think about that maybe. But um, <laughs> no, I, it's interesting to see. Also, what I learned from many colleagues of mine the more you think about that, cosmological questions and so on, the more religious you are becoming. Mm -hmm. You have some, uh, yeah, you are driven by the idea that there must be more behind. So I've known what this could be. I will not learn in my life, that's for sure as well. The question is, can everyone learn? It in to, 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 totally, I think I don't think so, but at least there is there is hope, there is expectation. Yeah. We should be optimistic. Wonderful! What a beautiful way to to end that beautiful conversation. Also in awful Thank times, <laughs> or in particular in awful times. In awful times. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and let's hope for the very best. Thank you so much. Thank you. Subject. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much for this nice discussion. Thank you for being with us today. I need to get out now. South by Southwest is waiting. Don't take it personally, of course. I'm always on the lookout to bring you new guests. So stay tuned.